Welcome to the No More Late Fees podcast. I'm Jackie. And I'm Danielle. And we're just two best friends and ex-Blockbuster employees re-watching some of the best and worst movies from the late 90s and early 2000s. This week, we are getting a shape up with the 2002 film Barbershop. But before we dive in, let's get into some housekeeping. If you love the podcast and you want to support us, here's a few ways you can. Did you know writing a review and or rating us helps get us more listeners? Like this review from D Graves of Surely You Can't Be Serious podcast. Five stars. Fantastic. Listen. What a great podcast. High energy fun with Danielle and Jackie having great conversations with very cool guests. These ladies are taking me back to some great movies from back in the day. Thanks, okay. Dee. That was so sweet for you to leave us a note. I like their podcast. Definitely you guys should check them out. And if you want to be featured and help us grow, head to Apple, Spotify, Podchasers, Good Pods, or your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review. And if you haven't subscribed yet, Make sure you hit the subscribe button on your favorite podcast platform so that you get notifications when a new episode from our lovely podcast comes in. And while you're playing on your phone subscribing, head over to nomorelatefees.redbubble.com and check out our merch. We got something for everyone. Dogs, babies, (laughs) yourself, your home. It's all there. So go ahead and check it out. And let's dive into the movie. So Barbershop is about Calvin, who just inherited a struggling barbershop business from his deceased father, and he views the shop as nothing but a burden and waste of time. After selling the shop to a local loan shark, Calvin slowly begins to see his father's vision and legacy and struggles with the notion that he just sold out. Eek. The movie stars Ice Cube, Anthony Anderson, Sean Patrick Thomas, Eve, Troy Garrity, Michael Ely. Sorry. (laughs) This is why this is my background. (laughs) Leonard Earl Housley. I think that's how you say his name. Keith David and Cedric the Entertainer. The movie was directed by Tim Story. And the screenplay was written by Mark Brown, Don D, Scott and Marshall Todd. Let's get into our ratings rewinds. So you know the drill. Before we get into the movie, we'll reveal the rating our YTK versions of ourselves we give. Then at the end, we'll see if our current selves agree with our initial rating. Our scale consists of would buy it, would buy it again. The best would play and repeat. Five day rental. Would watch again. Two day rental. Okay, but nothing to write home about. And same day rental. Yeah, you might as well make this an ATM that you stole (laughs) from the local Indian neighbor that you can't open that gets blown up and just okay I I went too far it's trash it's trash it's trash (laughs) no good anymore Jackie I have never seen barbershop I don't know how I missed it because I watched everything I have no excuse I've never seen (laughs) (laughs) You know, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I, I well, I, I did watch it. I think I even went to the movies to see it. <sighs> but it was nothing that like I wanted to watch again. I, I feel like, like at the you. time, yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna give it a two day rental. Okay. Well, tell us a little bit about the box office. The movie had a budget of $12 million and it made over $77 million worldwide. It made about $21 million in its opening weekend. And similar to what he achieved with his 1997 film, Soul Food, producer George Tillman Jr. wanted to portray African-Americans in a more positive and three-dimensional light than many other Hollywood films had in the past. I I do also want to note that Tim Story, who directed the movie, has gone on to direct so many of our favorite classics, like, well, that's a bad, he, 
I was going to say like Fantastic Four, but that's a horrible example. It's just the first one that came to my mind. But he he did Think Like a Man, Ride Along, and he didn't come back for, because there's multiple barbershop sequels. He didn't come back for those. And he just did that show Queens that was on that uh, he directed two episodes of Queens. And unfortunately that show got canceled and that was with Eve again. So, but he did the ride along movies and he also did both Fantastic Four movies, which I had no idea they were directed by a black man. From the ones from the 2000s, the Fantastic Four and then the Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer. He directed those movies. Uh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not that the ones from like the 2010s were they, any better. They can't get it. They can't get it right. They just oh. can't. But mm-hmm. when John Krasinski came out as Reed and Doctor Strange, whew. Well, it's funny because they fan casted him for that. Like people have been talking about it forever. And now right now there's rumors that Penn Badgley may be the one that is in like the actual, this universe, the MCU. So it should be interesting to see if that pans out. If that pans out. (laughs) (laughs) I see what you did. I did, I did. (laughs) (laughs) We start out someone's at home and then a truck is reversed into a quickie mart they are stealing the atm and then what it is the like (laughs) it is the most arduous way you could go to try to steal something anything the way that they try to steal this goddamn atm and i i want to go on fudging record to say that this subplot of getting the ATM machine, you could cut it all out and it would be I, nothing for this movie. I was going to say the exact same thing. We could have had this first scene and then at the end, just have a surprise reveal like they're trying <laughs> to cut it open. And then Ricky's like, that was my truck. That was my cut. That's all we needed. And I get we needed some filler because this movie is only an, an hour and 40 minutes long anyway. And that's right. about half the movie is these <laughs> idiots trying to bust open this ATM. But we could have gotten something better. I feel like if we had a better subplot, yeah, this would have made the movie a hundred times better. Yeah. When I, of course, when I rewatched it, I didn't remember anything normal, Danielle, but I was just like, is a subplot going to, is it just this ATM shit or is something going to be going on with the loan shark? It would have been a really great way to talk about like gentrification or talking Mm -hmm. about the unity of the neighborhood and, you know, really diving into some of the things that Calvin's dad believed in about community if they had done a subplot where it's like some an outsider coming in trying to mess with them in some way yeah but just missed opportunities as much as I love a Tate brother you know Lorenz and this in this movie we have Lamar Tate which is Lorenz Tate's brother dumb as hell in this movie and Anthony 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 Anderson is great too yeah that's why I was so baffled it was it was not good it was this like this whole subplot was not good even if we got into more of like their outside lives or something Mm -hmm. I don't know I think or even if like we use that time because there are definitely call outs of like you said this is how your dad viewed things or like when she's like we met in this barber shop do a flashback right do something like we could have filled that time with like flashbacks of how it used to be and even Cedric the entertainer's character Eddie when he's reminiscing about all of the things he was there for to witness in that barber shop right that would have been a far better use of that time I think even if they had started the movie showing what that neighborhood looked like in that time period showing Calvin's dad cutting hair and that would have really cemented what where we were going and also I think it would have been great if Calvin had a real cemented dream like Mm -hmm. something that 
he, you know, because I, I, I don't have a family business, but I see so many times and in movies, there's tropes about family businesses where there's always that one family member who's just like, I don't want to do this. And yeah. this is my dream. I want to like in while you were sleeping, he wanted to make handmade furniture, not resell furniture from estates and all that mm-hmm. stuff. Right. But Calvin didn't have nothing. What you talk about the studio, the recording studio <laughs> with the yes. equipment that you bought for no reason. Like, come on, yeah. Calvin. His wife was way too understanding. <laughs> I would have cut a bitch up a hundred percent. Because she says, like, the recording studio is his latest get-rich-quick scheme, right? He doesn't really care. He's not passionate about, like, recording music or anything, or it doesn't seem like he is. Plus, she lists that he had previously had a t-shirt business. That hurt a little bit. I make t-shirts on the side. (laughs) You Um, felt called out, Jackie. (laughs) I did. I felt called out just a tiny bit. And then it seemed like he had an MLM vitamin business. He was just trying to grasp at something. I agree. Like if he was even like, I want to be a writer or something that he could still run the barbershop and still do. And then he just had to come to terms with like, oh, I can do both. That would have been a much better plot than these like crazy harebrained schemes. He was giving very much Gregory. Yeah. (laughs) Which Gregory is my dad. And when I tell you, that this man every time he got a vitamin business he did vitamix he did dvd like everything he would buy fubu knockoffs he was selling he always had his hand in something and that was very much what calvin was giving except no no i was gonna say except my dad had direction no i would have to constantly throw out and clean out his apartment because he would just have all the things that he bought that didn't go anywhere he didn't sell it well and so i'm just realizing this now there is a entrepreneur that keeps coming into the barbershop to like shop sell whatever he had on hand yeah and that was just like exactly what calvin was gonna do (laughs) just in a different way but he was like get out of here with that stuff and eventually the guy's like who had the part to fix your AC? <laughs> exactly. Who had this? Like, why are you shaming me when, like, I've helped you out? You know? I, so D. Ray Davis, the, the comedian who plays that character, his character's name is called Hustle Guy in this movie. I kept writing the hustlers <laughs> back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I had some, I had some issues with, just Calvin not feeling like a character I could root for yeah in the beginning I think he gets there and and I I think in the second movie he's a little bit more grounded after this fair (laughs) so yeah now we've met Calvin his wife is very very pregnant and she's kind of calling him out like what what's going on why is the recording equipment that's trying to kill you in the basement she doesn't get it and he tells this story about how oprah's boyfriend stedman (laughs) has this like auxiliary house next to her house and that's what he wants that's the dream not oprah's house and he does clarify later i don't want oprah's house i want stedman's house (laughs) So at least his dreams, his dreams are are, are attainable. <laughs> I'm not laughing at that because shit, I'd want Stedman's house too. Yeah. But it's just so funny how specific he is. And he not only does he mention it, he has a picture. He is literally trying to manifest this. He's probably put, pasting it on his vision board. Vision board. <laughs> I do want to critique that there really isn't there are women in this movie but these women do not have anything really added to their character but surface level you know when you look at Calvin's wife she is very much in support of Calvin's character 
Mm-hmm. So it's like you look at her and think, okay, he must not be like a horrible jerk if he can have this like very sweet loving wife. Right. I do like later on she does call him out on his shit, but we don't know, we don't learn anything else about her. Like zero. Nothing. N- nothing at all. Which is I feel is a missed opportunity. Then we have Terry which is Eve's character. And I think we see some dynamics because she's very hard, which Mm -hmm. is probably needed to work in a barbershop. And we see some softness kind of seep through here and there. Um, But I feel like there could have been more. And then every other woman that's in there is just like used for physicality, pretty much like they are objectified 100%. And I'm not going to say like, this is the first movie to do this. It's not the worst incarnation of it. But it was very disappointing. Yeah. Because even e- the character of Terry, like all of her motivations are driven by a man. Mm-hmm. So she wasn't given range to just be herself. It was boyfriend's cheating on her. And now this other guy likes her. Like all of that. Except for her damn apple juice. That's <laughs> <laughs> one of my pictures. Because it's... <laughs> Yeah. All she has in life is a bottle of apple juice with a giant ass red sign that <laughs> says, don't drink me. And someone drank the damn apple juice. Continues to torture her with drinking her apple juice. Yeah. I honestly don't know why she even keeps it in the fridge at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Sorry. Continue. So we, we've met Calvin and his wife. We've met JD and Billy, who are the two thieves. And now Calvin's going to open up the barbershop for the day. And this takes place over just the span of a day. Right. And the movie was filmed in Chicago during the winter 2001 and early 2002. And they used the storefront in the South Chicago community area, 79th Street and Exchange Avenue, if for any of you Chicagoans, that I guess was once a laundromat. And they used it to build the set for Calvin's Barbershop. And then they made a set, made a duplicate on a sound stage on a sound stage. So love another movie from that was filmed in Chicago. Calvin shows up to open up the barbershop for the day, and he sees the owner of the convenience store flipping out because someone has driven into his store. It was a brand new ATM. And he and tells be- him, stay strong, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah because the atm like when they pulled the atm out it, they didn't like just knock out a window like the whole front of this man's establishment is pretty much gone yeah so yeah i i just he had I, every right to be flipping out yes he did <laughs> <laughs> and and that part is important because it comes up later yeah then he's unlocking the barbershop and the lady who owns, I'm assuming, is it a salon next door? Yeah. She's opening up hers and running her mouth about <laughs> Nisha Jenkins' boy got a drug problem. And he's like, why are you always gossiping? Not, yeah. We're, our stores aren't even open yet. It's too early for this shit. But she like, she's not phased in the least. She just keeps going on and on. But you know what's funny though? Like, men always say that like women gossip right but what I love about this movie is that I think someone just had an idea like someone's like pitch me a a, a black movie and they were like you know we gotta talk about the barbershop like everything goes down in the barbershop it's like the heart of the community and and like so many conversations are started I mean LeBron James even has a tv show now that is placed in a barbershop and asking different questions and stuff like that to spark community conversations but it's true so much stuff is told and talked about in a barbershop and the same goes for beauty salons it's Mm -hmm. just that when we do it from a female lens at the beauty salon it is Gossip. gossip but when it's done at the barbershop it's what happens at the barbershop happens at the barbershop you know like come on it's just bro. like bro talk right yeah. but bro talk very much is gossip yeah interesting to mm. say lamar stops by he needs a very specific haircut but has no money and so <laughs> because he's got a job interview yes 
And so and Calvin, yeah, Calvin's like, no, you got to come back later when you have money to pay me because Calvin's bills are past due. He owes on the taxes. He he's hurting. So the bank manager shows up. He's like, we can't give you another loan. You've already done a small business loan. You've received a grant. Like we can't help you out anymore. And it, it feels like some of that money was given to him for his get rich quick schemes well, and not actually for the barbershop. So it looks, so I feel like that bank manager, I mean, obviously it's not normal for the bank manager to just come down to your establishment. This is a relationship that was established most likely with Calvin's dad. Mm-hmm. And so you have good and Calvin is interesting in the sense that he is annoyed at the way that his father kind of did business Mm -hmm. because he looks at business in in the goal of making a ton of money having Stedman houses you know Mm -hmm. while with his dad really looked at it as a cornerstone of the community and building connections with friends and neighbors and whatnot and at the end of this movie it he gets to that point where he realizes that because Eddie says to him, your dad invested in people mm-hmm. and those investments are still paying off. Like, yeah, the bank guys like try tried to really work hard to get him the loan. And I'm sure he got him the original loan mm-hmm. and it was probably in use for the business, the barbershop, because it had equity. But instead, he probably used it on, like you said, the get rich schemes. And then you see other people who are coming asking for a haircut for free. It's not a normal thing. They probably go to any other barbershop to do is because the dad used to do these things because mm-hmm. he knew that people were worth giving them a chance. Right. And Calvin doesn't have that same belief. So he is reaping the benefits of his dad doing those things in certain aspects, but in other aspects, he is like, I don't do that. Yeah. So a lot of lessons to be learned here, Calvin. There is. So then Calvin calls Mr. Wallace Who and asks him what? Who's the loan? Who's like a, a local loan shark, right? Yeah, we don't find that out yet, though. So yeah. he just calls him and asks him to come to the barbershop, meet him. Because I, I'm assuming Mr. Wallace has previously approached him about. Yeah. Um, so Calvin's desperate, calls Mr. Wallace. We get more. I'm not even going to talk about the ATM bandit shit because <laughs> it's, so dumb. it's like home alone. It's real stupid shit. That really? That's it. It's real yeah. stupid shit. So then we see Terry is showing up to her boyfriend at Kevin's apartment. He's like, come in. And she's like, I know you got another girl in here. <laughs> He's like, oh, if I did, I'd hide her under the bed. You should check under the bed, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, oh, never mind. Like He makes her out to seem like she's crazy, right? Yeah. Like the way that it's set up is that here she comes again. She's crazy. And then she does, then the girl from under the bed actually does come out, which I don't understand why, why? this is like a trope that happens in these movies. Like, why did you get out of the from under the bed? First of all, why did you go under the bed in the first place? <laughs> Where is your pride, lady? But if it was Eve, I'd, I'd run too. She looked like she was going to beat that lady's ass. <laughs> oh, it was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Terry doesn't play. And you hear, so the lady pops out from under the bed. Terry goes into fight mode. And from outside the apartment, you just hear, cover your face, cover your face. (laughs) And the sad sad thing is like, so now you've seen that this is most likely a pattern that has happened Mm -hmm. in their relationship. Just prior to back at the barbershop, we meet Jimmy. (laughs) And he orders the most complicated coffee order (laughs) I've ever, like these TikTok orders ain't got nothing on jimmy <laughs> <laughs> and they get so mad because he they never get it right but it's so convoluted like dude you're so extra so a lot of the different characters in the barbershop definitely represent different archetypes stereotypes within the black community especially black males sean patrick thomas they call him college boy his character jimmy 
because he went to college, but he cuts hair, but he takes every opportunity that he can to make it very well known that he's smarter than everyone else. He's very nose in the air kind of vibes and looks down on his peers essentially like bitch you are better than nobody what are you talking about he's worse he (laughs) patched that kid (laughs) yo i would have straight like punched him in the face what are you doing yeah it was bad yeah (laughs) so now we are in the barber shop everyone's kind of arriving for the day we get this long drawn out ask conversation just objectifying women with large asses. And then this is when Ricky shows up. Ricky. And he goes <laughs> in the back to put his stuff in his locker and he has a gun on him and he puts it in his locker. That will come back into play later. And then a detective comes into the shop and starts questioning Ricky about the robbery across the street because Ricky has two prior felonies. And so He's immediately- got- one more strike well does he have felonies or just like i'm pretty sure that's what the three strikes rule is is yeah well it's interesting because this cop very much has it in for ricky and Mm -hmm. through this whole situation and dialogue we learn learn without it really being said a hundred percent that calvin has invested in ricky essentially hired him to work at the barber shop And is trying to keep him on the straight and narrow um, Mm -hmm. and out of trouble. But this cop does not care and is essentially harassing him. And to me, that that really irked a nerve for me even more because it's just like, (sighs) dude, it's already hard enough, you know, because he's a black cop. So it's just like, why? Yeah. Why are you, you know, the, the guy's not even doing anything. Yeah. He's at work. He's at least he's showing up for work. So and when it's they, an honest living. But when the ATM gets stolen, his first suspect, it's like Freddie from Scooby-Doo always going after red herring. Always. Yeah. And so he, he messes with, with Ricky quite a bit that he's like, I'm just waiting to take you to jail essentially. So mm-hmm. But he's really cool with Calvin, on the other hand, which I think here's probably another situation where Calvin is reaping the benefits of his dad. This cop probably came since he was younger to get his hair cut here. So he's cool with Calvin. And then the next character we meet is Isaac. So Isaac is (laughs) white, but embraces the culture. Isaac essentially is a culture vulture, but there's nuance, I guess, to it. There Mm -hmm. are culture vultures like Kenny from Can't Hardly Wait or Malibu's Most Wanted, where they take on the aesthetic of everything that is Black culture. But when their asses to the wall they quickly drop it and they become back to their white narrative. Now it seems like Isaac just ride or die immersed into the black culture, Mm -hmm. white people who white people, what like he doesn't, he doesn't know. Now, is it still not the greatest thing? Yeah, it's not, but there's a lot of Isaac's, in the black community that black people embrace you know Mm -hmm. when I went to school we had we you know our fraternities and sororities they would let some Isaacs in essentially yeah and we see Isaac has a black girlfriend so she's saying goodbye to he's saying goodbye to her by fully making out in front of the barbershop they're like sucking on each other's tongues it was an interesting there's a look. lot of tongues <laughs> but also this is the first full-on butt shot that means tim story had to like he didn't even just like zoom in he took he the camera and 
focused on this girl's ass for a good amount of time. Yeah. And not only that, but Isaac grabbing her ass repeatedly. I thought he was going to put his fucking digits up her butthole. (laughs) It seemed like that. And Jimmy was watching the whole time. Yeah. Jimmy is such a fucking hater. (laughs) I can't. I can't. Jimmy. Because we, you notice we ain't seen Jimmy with no ladies. No. Because he's jealous. Here comes Eminem wannabe Isaac with a beautiful black sister. And what Jimmy got? His college degree. <laughs> and a um... a latte with a smidge <laughs> of hazelnut and a sprinkle of orange rind. <laughs> With his cold foam in another cup because they never put it on correctly. <laughs> Girl, bye. <laughs> Just ridiculous. And then next we meet Dinka, who is a West African who is working at the barbershop. Very sweet. They say something about his size. And oh. he says, where I come from to have girth is a sign of opulence. <laughs> Very true. Like, yeah. So... When it, I think in the black community, especially when it comes to like weight, you know, obviously we have terms like thick and stuff like that. You know, there's a there's a scale mm-hmm. of where your body can fit into, and it's not as stringent as it is within the white community that the idea of beauty is skinny. Mm-hmm. But the way that they characterize this man or they make this man's character a caricature yeah i would i would assume africans would probably be quite pissed off by the way that they treat him not great not great no not great not great but Um, he is very sweet he's very sweet i i also feel like the where i come from to have girth is a sign of opulence could have been said by moira rose at one point (laughs) (laughs) very true (laughs) like it just feels the words feel very very moira (laughs) rose-esque and And he has flowers too right yes so he he brings flowers he puts them in the back room and then eddie comes waltzing in plays cedric played by cedric the entertainer i fucking Um, hate hate this character me too fucking hate him okay continue so although cedric the entertainer played the elder statesman he was only 37 when this was shot so obviously they gave him fake gray hair and things of that nature eddie has just been there forever seen it all he seems to have really good shaving skills but as one character eventually points out your chair is always empty why is that (laughs) And it's kind of like, it's explained in the movie that the longer you're there and the more skilled you are, you get a chair towards the back of the shop. Mm -hmm. And so Isaac is at the very front, like Jimmy and Ricky are kind of in the middle. And then Eddie and Calvin, Calvin are at the back. And also like, you have to think that he's older. He's probably not working to work he's coming because the barbershop is his home it's his family he's a lot of hot opinions as this character but it's almost like he's calvin's uncle everyone looks to him as an elder Mm -hmm. so it's like even though these people aren't related to each other there is a hierarchy like you said you know yeah and then we see kind of just some of the nuances of the barbershop no rap before 10 a.m that's not being adhered to i feel like that sign probably came from his dad uh, calvin's dad's time because there is very much a split in generations when it comes to rap music within our community because rap music was almost the same way that white people white people's parents probably felt about like rock and roll when it Mm -hmm. came out you know and then they have a can that says johnny raggedy shoe fun And so they're raising money for Johnny, who we don't see until towards the end. And you find out through conversation that he's a basketball player and he needs new cleats. And Mm -hmm. so they're raising money for him. I think he's a basketball player. He needs new sports shoes. 
Sorry. Yeah, because I know I was going to say, uh, I don't know much about the sports, but I don't think they wear cleats in basketball. Maybe football? Was yeah. Johnny playing football? Cleats? I think they wear cleats in soccer, no? I don't know. Johnny was tall, so I went to basketball. Anyway, so there is a character that we meet later on. It shows the sense of community. Like, this kid is really good. He doesn't have the shoes to play, so they're going to earn money to buy him his shoes so there's a can they're raising money for johnny plays some sport and they're raising money for to buy him new shoes then terry shows up like a fucking tornado and what i love is that everyone knows her moods at this point which is it's also annoying because it it makes it a part of her character but it also speaks to like how men see women and women when they have emotions they're emotional but clearly like in the movie we see jimmy and ricky have many explosions of emotions but nobody Mm -hmm. like gets all tense about it but anyway she walks in pissed as hell goes to the back slams the door and what i love in this scene is that one of the customers like put starts putting his coat on (laughs) and they're like where are you going on your next he's like I'm not letting Terry cut my hair in that mood. I'll be back later. And he yeah. is out. And, and that makes sense. You don't want someone touching your hair when they're pissed like that. Yeah. So she finds the roses that Dinka left her because we find out that's who the roses were for. Mm-hmm. And someone drank her apple juice. <laughs> So we are, as the audience, we're never shown who drinks the audience in the main movie. We do find out in the video DVD extras that Eddie, who's played by Cedric the Entertainer, is the one who actually drank her juice. But in the beginning of the film, when we're introduced to Ricky and Jimmy is already at the shop, we see Jimmy in the fridge looking at the apple juice and looking at the, at the note. So both Ricky and the audience kind of assume that maybe it was Jimmy that drank the juice. And it seems to be something that happens all the time because she loses her shit. Well, because she already has like a giant ass sign on it. Right. And to the point where at first I'm like, is that someone's like urine in the jar? And that's why (laughs) they're like, don't drink this because this is my clean pee. Ew. (laughs) That's where my mind went. But no, it's just apple juice. And Terry loves her apple juice and someone keeps drinking it. And so Ricky immediately is like, it was Jimmy. He, He was touching your apple juice this morning. And Jimmy, I love... How he says, do you have ocular proof? (laughs) (laughs) Like he can't just be a normal person and say, did you see me drink the juice? He had to use his SAT words (laughs) because he's educated. Do you have ocular proof? I'm edumacated. I don't know about you. And I'm going to show it at every chance I can. And so Jimmy and Ricky start going at it, arguing Calvin has to break it up. Her friend is over there just <laughs> giving his two cents. He doesn't work at the barbershop. He's just there playing checkers all day. That's his setup, you know? Retirement. <laughs> this is what it looks like. I do love when Calvin's like, checkerboard, Fred, go sit your ass down and stop it. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's like, do I look like my father? And everyone at the same time is like, well, yeah, yeah, like in yeah, the yeah, yeah, you, you kind of do. <laughs> And so, oh, because that's what Checker Fred says. He goes, <laughs> your dad would have never allowed this kind of behavior <laughs> in the in the barbershop. And he's that's when he tells him to go to sit down. And he's like, do I look like my dad? And everyone's like, yeah, yeah kind of. Um, and then Eddie, still stirring the fucking pot, he's like, well, inquiring minds want to know who did it. And then he <laughs> says, it wasn't me. I'm lactose intolerant. To apple juice? <laughs> I think I missed that part. But yeah, like while the fighting is happening, he's like saying these one-off things. Nobody's even paying attention to his ass. Knowing damn well, Eddie, you drank the fucking apple juice. It was you, Eddie. <laughs> it was you. More ATM stuff. I do like this scene where they smuggle it into Billy's house and his mom's there listening to the news when they're reporting that there is an ATM theft. And she's like, somebody didn't raise their kids right. It's you, bitch. 
is you yeah so Sassy they're in Gabby. in his room and he locks the door and anthony anderson's well jd says did you lock the door and he's like yeah but the sister has a fucking key into his room and i don't know the i this subplot has to be I one know. of the worst things ever the worst so essentially they have to pay Gabby off, the little sister, not to tell mama that the ATM machine is there. So now they have to move it to a different location. This subplot just includes injuries, moving the ATM <laughs> from location to location to hide it. And Billy just being stupid. Billy's not bright. Billy's He's not bright not. at all. Not in the slightest i'm laughing now but it's not because it's like legitimately funny it's just so fucking stupid but at one point when they are trying to move it to another space they keep running into this one neighbor who is a really big guy and he never waits for them to come down or go up the stairs he always has to go first and I thought they were going to fall through those wood stairs when that happened. Yeah. So he gets injured through that that scene. And then also at some point, because Billy's so fucking stupid, he sees another guy who owes him money across the way and drops the ETM on JD's foot and runs after, just takes off after this guy. And later on, he, one, we find out that the guy only owed him five fucking dollars for a game of crap. <laughs> a game of crap. And JD's foot is messed up. Like they take off his shoe and his sock and it's all, it's gross. Like I'm surprised the foot didn't come off. That's how bad it was. It was, there, he definitely had broke tarsals and it was like, throbbing <laughs> it was so bad and billy's dumbass says I, oh i need to get you a band-aid a <laughs> band-aid <laughs> i did write that down because that did make me chuckle a little bit but and, that was like the only part of this whole <laughs> subplot that made me laugh but at all i say all this because the main <laughs> the main thing that made me actually laugh besides the band-aid thing was jd's like you know what no I'll go get the band-aid because you can't even be trusted to even do that because you always fuck up shit. Yeah. And ain't that the truth? <laughs> Just do it myself. <laughs> so meanwhile, back at the barbershop, Eddie's eating wings and they're complaining that he didn't bring enough for everyone. This is when Jimmy patches the kid's head. And then Mr. Wallace shows up. What? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it looked like you had something. Yeah. What? What kind of car did Mr. Wallace have? Cadillac? You're in the ballpark. Every black man got a Cadillac. <laughs> it's a Lincoln Continental. Is that it? Oh, so that's not a Cadillac. It's a Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference? So Lincoln they're two makes, different brands. Oh, Lincoln doesn't make a Cadillac. Cadillac no. makes a Cadillac. Yeah, it's like a Volkswagen and a Ford. Two, okay, two well, that's different what brands. I, all right. <laughs> <laughs> and I was so proud I sent Danielle a screen cap because I said, I paused the movie and I was pretty sure it was the Lincoln Continental because it has the suicide doors. If you ever watch Entourage, that's what they drive. Theirs is a convertible in the uh -huh. beginning credits. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure that is a Lincoln Continental. We own Crown Imperial, which is the same car, just not the. Is that a Lincoln as well? No. So Crown is a different manufacturer, you know but they what? made almost the same. Cars. I know the car was blue. <clears throat> it was a blue car. There you we go. Correct. Hot damn. <laughs> but okay. I did pause the movie, take a picture. I was like, honey, is this a Lincoln Continental? And I was right. And I was very proud of myself because <laughs> I'm growing in my car knowledge. And I am not. Uh, obviously, because Lincoln and Cadillac are not the same manufacturer. I just know why people love a Lincoln and they love a Cadillac. That's, That's it. True. That's true. 
So Mr. Wallace shows up. He has 20 grand in cash that he's willing to give Calvin. And he says, the, don't worry. The sign out front will always say barbershop. But if you take this cash, it's as good as a contract. And I'll get the contract to you to sign later on. And Calvin's like, okay, cool. Calvin feels like he has his back against a wall. He Calvin should have never taken the money. I would have been like, I want my contract first. Yeah. All so, of this is weird. Calvin takes the 20 grand, sells the barbershop to Mr. Wallace. And Mr. Wallace is like, oh yeah, like we're going to keep the name barbershop, but we're turning it into a strip club. I mean, that would actually be a really cool business model to get haircuts and it'd be a nudie bar. I'm just saying. I'm pretty sure there's places out there that like give topless haircuts. No, no. You have your barber, right? But there's like a, you can see the stage Um, while you're getting your haircut. And then while you're sitting there, could you imagine you're getting cut? (laughs) Just making it rain. Yeah. (laughs) I like that. (laughs) So as soon as Mr. Wallace reveals his true intentions, Calvin's trying to get out of it. Mr. Wallace is like, no, I told you once you take this money, that is as good as a signed contract. And peace is out. It would be called Clips and Nips. Would the poles be like the barber? Yes. A hundred percent. All those all the drinks come in like the 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 sanitation. (laughs) I love it. Welcome to clips and nips. (laughs) The nips are to the left, the clips are to the right, you know. (laughs) Just saying. Let's see. This is so this is where Eddie is giving the shaving lesson and starts ranting on and on about how these young kids don't have any skill. They have no history. Old heads oh. love to do that shit. It's so annoying. And I feel like I'm just like that now. Back <laughs> in my day, we had a place called Blockbuster. And let me tell you, I had to be on my feet for eight hours a day and listening to these people ask me where this one was and where this movie was. And then I had to take all this shit out of the box and alphabetize. It was a hard time. What do y'all got to do now? You got the Netflix, you know? <laughs> you just scroll <laughs> and click. <laughs> Are you a fan of nostalgia? Have you ever rewatched a film from your childhood and thought, what the hell was I thinking liking this so much? Or have you ever rewatched a film and thought, wow, I forgot how amazing this movie was? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then we have a podcast for you. My name is Steph. And I'm Lex. And we are Chasing Childhood, a weekly podcast where two 20-something-year-old cousins review our and your childhood favorites. From The Wizard of Oz to Shrek and everything in between, we're out to see if that movie you loved as a kid still holds up now that we're adults. We release new episodes every Wednesday, and you can find us on all podcast streaming platforms. Give us a follow on Instagram and TikTok at Chasing Childhood Podcast and on Facebook at Chasing Childhood. Join us and let's chase our childhoods together. Calvin's wife, Jennifer, shows up to talk. Not talk. Put her foot in his ass. Yeah. Because the nosy lady who owns the beauty salon called her, called his wife to say, Jennifer, girl, you know, Mr. Wallace over here. Mm-hmm, girl, yes, he just pulled up. I just saw his Continental pull up to the shop. He was in there for a little bit talking to Calvin, and I don't know what's going on, but you better come down here real quick. <laughs> that was a perfect reenactment of that <laughs> scene. <laughs> so Jennifer shows up and she's like, What the fuck are you doing? He's like, I got 20 grand. Look at me. <laughs> We're rich. We're on our way to Stedman's house. And grand Stemma could piss out 20 grand. He says, this is for us. And she's like, I, I am not involved in any of your decisions. I'm not involved in any decisions about your other businesses. 
And this is about you and you make all of these decisions. And we get a little history. His grandfather was the one who opened the barbershop. Calvin s tries to say we're in debt because my dad gave away free haircuts. And she's like, when we got the barbershop, there was very little debt. Right. Little to none. Yeah. It was his idiot schemes, his Ponzi schemes that have gotten them in the hole. And she just like, there's all the history with the family, but also that's where we met, you know, yeah. since we were young. And honestly, I don't know how she wasn't even more concerned considering they're about to have a baby. Yeah. You don't make these kind of financial decisions right as we're like expanding our family. That's insane. What is $20,000 does not a salary make? Like, what are you going to do? You think the world, who's going to this recording studio? What recording studio are you talking about? The equipment alone, 20,000 would be gone in a blink of, a, of an eye. Yeah. I would well, I, I guess it's essentially 40,000 because that's just, but still that's nothing. Yeah. Dummy. <laughs> so this is when they assess the foot at the motel. <laughs> and the only thing else I want to add to this scene is Billy does say he needs a band-aid. And then JD comes back with, I just need to rub some cocoa butter on it. That's about right. There's <laughs> a few things that will cure everything. Any ailment, cocoa butter, Vicks, pour some tussin on it, <laughs> and ginger ale, and tea. That's it. You got those elements? You'll live for, forever. I'm gonna live oh, forever. sorry. And Jesus. <laughs> That's it. I love that. Yeah. So back at the barber shop. Calvin is finishing up with a customer. Fish was waiting. Fish is a person. Mm -hmm. He was waiting his turn and Lamar shows back up <laughs> and sneaks the seat. And, and Calvin's like, do you have my money? He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. No problem. And he cleans him up real good. Yeah. And <laughs> during this time, they're having a discussion. The barber shop in general is having a discussion about how does it start? Is it about Isaac? Yes. So Jimmy calls out Isaac and is like, you shouldn't even be working here. Like this place isn't for you. And Isaac's like, I'm still earning my spot. Why not? And so Terry makes the analogy of Tony Roma's got good ribs and he's white. <laughs> no, she does not say good ribs. She says the, the best. best ribs. I'm surprised she didn't get fucking shot right then and there because there is one thing we don't play with and that's motherfucking ribs Tony Robo ain't got no better ribs than anybody else in the black community you crazy girl you crazy so now everyone's fighting arguing about who has the best ribs and Jimmy and Isaac are still bickering and Lamar takes this opportunity to skirt on out without paying the bill and so calvin's like this motherfucker <laughs> and he tries to catch him but you know he was out so calvin is pissed so we get more atm crap and then <laughs> terry's still talking about her apple juice real upset about the apple juice situation and someone says the indian guy across the street and jimmy's like he's not indian he's from pakistan he's pakistani goes into this whole rant about go ahead that's because eddie's ignorant ass just goes on and on about like he's not from here doesn't matter and all this other shit like just talking real out of the side of his mouth and, kept, and keeps saying like really ignorant things about native americans and like essentially calling him a native american and they're like he's not and that's what prompts jimmy to say like hey he's not even He's not Native American. But like, Eddie is so wrong. So wrong. So just ridiculous about what he's saying. But a lot of older people and from that time say so many ignorant things. And it's just like, oh God. Because we know better now, you know? Yeah. But 
Eddie is egregious about it and just cannot stop. Yeah. Every every chance he gets. And then there's a lady beating a car with a baseball bat. <laughs> she does it just like in a window. It's like she fucks that whole car up. And when they were talking about it, it's a new Camry, I was like, new Camry where? Yeah, it didn't look like a new Camry even in 2002. No, not even the slightest. But there's a guy at the sink getting his hair washed and everybody is at the window watching her literally lemonade the shit out of this car. And he keeps asking, he's like, oh, it's a Camry. I love a Camry. I got a Camry. But then he it starts to click. That's his fucking car. So he goes outside and <laughs> she's like saying, oh, you're not so-and-so? Oh, my Malcolm bad. Malcolm Brahms. And he's just like, he's he's like, like no. fuck Malcolm Brahm. <laughs> and he's like, who the fuck is that? This is my car. And she's like, oh, <laughs> sorry. And just like, gets in her <laughs> car and pieces of fuck out. <laughs> I, oh, I would have got on her license plate because there's no way. That like that's the whole car is damaged. Yeah. Oh Jesus! Every window, every <laughs> panel it has no side view mirrors left. But I again going back to the gossip feel of it. Nobody said like when to go stop that lady or anything. No, nope. they could have had popcorn. They were laughing. They're like, oh, <laughs> having a grand old time. That poor man. That poor poor man. Ricky. And Dinka have a scene where they're going to get lunch. And so Dinka is asking Ricky for dating advice because obviously Dinka likes Terry. Um, and Ricky is no a stranger to the ladies. And so <sighs> all he needed Rick- was a neck tattoo and I would have been done. So he That's had a neck s- tattoo. Where? Right there. Well, then right I'm done. So <laughs> I put on my lip gloss. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> but i ricky see is, you ricky <laughs> but ricky is very sweet and it's just like you just need to be yourself just be you don't worry about what other people are doing and then he like throws in a like how do you think captain kirk scored all those ladies i knew you were gonna love that line <laughs> ate it right up <laughs> <laughs> Ricky, not wrong. And also, <laughs> Ricky, plus it's Star Trekker. I'm on board. <laughs> so for me, it's the neck tattoo. For <laughs> you, it's a Star Trek reference. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm glad we're on the same page. Yeah. Here. We just we when, got to the, the page different routes, but we're we're both there together. When they ask if we have the same taste of men, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Does he have neck tattoos in like Star Trek? Then, then yes. yeah. Calvin's across the street, but he looks in and sees that Johnny is getting his shoes because they have raised enough money for the Johnny shoe fund. I don't know. Again, how I miss, <laughs> I miss Johnny. And I think this is where it clicks for him. Like, oh, the barbershop is that mm-hmm. sense of community and we're helping one another. Right. And so... He calls Mr. Wallace back and is like, I need to meet with you. Can I come to you? And in this exchange, he finds out because remember the earlier fight was that the owner of the convenience store is actually Indian. Correct. And so Calvin asked him about that. And so it's really funny because Jimmy yet again, thinking he knows everything, was absolutely wrong about this. And he's also just surprised at how open the owner is with the community and like another customer comes up and he's just like hey girl you know love you it's just like a lot of love that he has love for this community and also that whole interaction in the beginning of the movie where Calvin's like stay strong bro the owner is like oh that meant so much to me and you know the the drink is on the house like whatever and it's that's when he's like oh this guy is being real. He's not even joking. And yeah, Calvin is, like you said, everything's starting to click for him. Yeah. So Calvin obviously has a change of heart, is going to meet Mr. Wallace. The bodyguard is very upset that he 
disrespects him by walking right past him because it's his job and again yeah. even the way that the bodyguard and lester interact with calvin is still with like a kindness or a boundary essentially and i think even that comes from his dad and the relationships mm-hmm. that his dad had because obviously the bodyguard could essentially body the like hell out of calvin without a problem but he even when calvin the respect runs away, is there yeah he yeah. doesn't beat him up he's like man you made me run <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But it is disrespectful because his whole job is to make sure that his boss is not interrupted or is not in danger and like Calvin just walks right by him. So yeah, I get it. Calvin tries to give back the money and Mr. Wallace is like, no, are you trying to vex me? (laughs) He's like, I don't even know what vex me. And he's like, no, the money is yours. Shop is mine. If you give me my money by 7 p.m. But he wants the full 40 grand. Mm-hmm. even though he he's only given Calvin 20 so far. And Calvin's like, how am I supposed to get that amount of money in the short of time? Like I was broke when I came to you. Right. And so he leaves money. He's like, no, that money is yours. Peace is out. And this is when the bodyguard has to chase after him to give him his envelope of 20 grand back. Calvin almost gets away, but he hops a fence and there's like a <laughs> beware of dog sign. And so he has to hop back over and the bodyguard's like, this shit is yours take this money the shop is mr wallace's this is another atm scene that i out of all of them don't hate the least cringy and it's he's walking down the street (laughs) and the he has the atm on a dolly and the blanket (laughs) slips off and he the there's cops driving down the street and so he turns down a side street and props it up against the wall and pretends like he's withdrawing money (laughs) from it (laughs) <laughs> and then the police pull up and he's getting real nervous and then the cop gets behind him and pulls out his debit card like he's going to take money out too and JD doesn't know what to do but, but the he cops... plays it really cool because I yeah. was surprised he didn't say okay okay oh my god you know yeah. like he still is pretending that he's trying to get money out of it yeah just entering it like his pin real real slow <laughs> And the cops get a call. The partner's like, we got to go. We don't have time for this. But then another line forms of people just so like. So quickly. <laughs> it's like the ATM's broken. It's broken. <laughs> he just turns around and starts screaming it's broken at them. <laughs> and like out of all the shit that happens, like this is actually entertaining. Yeah. It's so much happens to him. He passes him by and he soaks him and the ATM. But in yeah. some point in the barbershop, we find out that, oh, when Calvin goes over to the convenience shop, the owner tells him that there was no money in the ATM because he just bought it. Mm-hmm. So jokes on them. So yes. then, then that makes the whole scenario even funnier because or bearable to say the least because these idiots are trying to get into it and there's no money in it yep so terry apologizes for messing up dinka's flowers she did say the card was really nice thank you for that right and then he tells there's a poem that he writes in the note that he gave her as well and he does give credit. It's a real poet named Pablo Neruda, which he says, but Pablo Neruda was a Nobel Prize winning Chilean poet who was once called the greatest poet of the 20th century in any language. So Dinka's, Dinka's poem to Eve is, it, she said it made her feel all gentle, was one of Pablo's actually love what is one of his love poems and obviously yeah. we would have never known that had we not do this movie because I, yeah. I didn't know who Pablo Neruda was so now I want to look at his poems oh and this right after this scene this is when you see Eve take the picture of her boyfriend out of her take it out of her locker and head back to her station and this is when her boyfriend comes into the shop Dinka he follows her out because of the pep talk he got from Ricky and he's like really gonna go for it so he's trying to ask her out and here comes the fool of the day her boyfriend Mm -hmm. and he brings her flowers and she's completely subdued considering how mad she was she 
just is not mentative with him. And it seems to be like a routine that they're constantly in. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'm really proud of her in the scene because she tells him like, "Mm, no, we are really done. And she tries to do it softly a little bit, but then he turns real quick into an asshole and tells her you're dumping me. You're not even that pretty. Just like, go ahead, (laughs) Jenny. What were you going to say? He told Eve, you're just average. I'm sorry. What? I, part of me is a little like I'm split because the guys in the shop, she didn't tell them what he did. I think if she had told them that he had cheated and all the stuff, maybe they would have been a little bit more protective when he Mm -hmm. came in. And also Jimmy makes a side comment earlier on that him, the boyfriend and her are constantly like, he's like, you're always going to take him back anyways. Mm -hmm. So I think that they've all kind of been through this routine with her and the guy. So I was like, all right, maybe that's why they don't come to their, her defense. And also I think they respect that she can kind of mitigate whatever she's dealing with. But when he does that and he belittles her in front of everybody and it almost looks like he's going to charge at her at one point. Yeah. Dinka, one, two punch, man. <laughs> and knocks a bitch down. Like, it, it becomes like a fight. And all the guys are like, oh, shit. And trying to pull them apart. But, you know, Dinka was ready to throw them hands. He mm-hmm. was. And there was all sorts of stupid African jokes there. But, yeah. Jason George, by the way, who... I personally love, despite this character in the movie, is on Grey's Anatomy and also on Station 19. But he also was in the Eve TV show later on after this movie, which is kind of a cool full circle moment for them. Yeah. So they're holding Kevin back and Terry back and Dinka back and Calvin doesn't want... Who turns on the music? Because Calvin's not in the store. He's coming back from Mr. Wallace's. So someone turns on the music to distract everyone and they start just having like a groove party. Yeah, because I think the people who were going to fight essentially, was it not, wasn't it Jimmy and, wasn't Jimmy going to fight? This is when, this is when Jimmy tells Isaac he doesn't belong. That's what starts the okay so Isaac and Jimmy are about to fight and that's when Terry comes and she jumps in front of Jimmy and starts dancing with him to kind of ease the tension and everybody who's in the movie is literally hearing the same Marvin Gaye song at the same time and so you see kind of like a dance montage which that's when Calvin comes back from the convenience store and sees it yeah, he sees like from across the street everyone dancing in the barber shop and like having that sense of family mm-hmm. and community. Calvin does try to sell his car at one point to <laughs> get money, and the guy's like, I can't take that piece of crap. Meanwhile, like all the other cars on his lot like have the bumpers fallen off and shit. Yeah, so but Cal- how much he was asking for it still was kind of ridiculous. Yeah. The detective gets a tip that they have a plate number from the truck. And an ATM mysteriously showed up at Poppy's convenience store and is now gone. So So he's got some leads. He's like, let's go get him when they run the tag. Mm -hmm. So we think that he's going to go find dumbass JD and Mm -hmm. Billy, but the cops like bust in and they actually take Ricky. And I was like, no, Ricky, no. And Calvin's pissed. I was like, I got bail. Yeah, because the way that they do it is with so much force. It was so unneeded to have like 20 cops to come in to drag him. I don't even think they read him as rights. They just drag his ass to jail Yeah, um, because it's itching to get him. Yeah, and Calvin's like, as soon as you get booked, call me. Right, which Um, is nice. We did miss a part where Calvin goes in the back and he's like just super upset and frustrated and he kicks the lockers and... Ricky's gun falls out so he takes it and puts it in a drawer and then we also see a conversation between Ricky and Jimmy Mm -hmm. 
where earlier Jimmy had said like a scallop's not even a shellfish, blah, 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 just showing off his knowledge. And Ricky's like, by the way, <laughs> a scallop is a shellfish. It's part of the mollusk family and goes like into detail about it. So it's like showing you don't have to be college educated to be knowledgeable about things. Right. And it, it really does put Jimmy in his place, shuts him up for a little bit. But shortly after like the whole cop situation, it's not long before Calvin tells Eddie and Eddie is like really, really pissed at Calvin. And then he goes into a monologue about the importance of the barbershop to the community their community in particular, but also as a whole for the Black community. And it's, so there's a lot of slick things that Eddie says. There's also some challenging things that he says in this movie from the like civil rights movement perspective. And so many small businesses like barbershops were really, really important to to the whole civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And collecting money, building community. They would use their shops as a way to have meetings to talk about boycotts and the things that they were doing to plan and help protect each other during that time. And I think that's kind of like where it built up to being such a cornerstone in the community, especially with young boys being able to find elders, Black males, that they could look up to and commune with and talk through things, especially if you didn't have access to that kind of community within your own personal family. So I think that was great that he goes into that monologue to speak to those efforts and um, the importance of, it's not just a place you go to get your hair cut essentially, Mm -hmm. you know? So Calvin, and then he does go into, like I said earlier about, that his father invested in people and not money. It was not important for his dad to make a whole bunch of money. Yeah. And so right after that, Lamar comes back and he's all excited. He got the job. He has the money to pay Calvin. And he talks about how I can finally put my daughter in actual daycare instead of letting my sister-in-law, who is a crackhead watcher. Mm. And so this just reaffirms Calvin the barbershop invests in people right. and, and makes their lives better. And so Lamar does pay him. And then Calvin's like, no, you, you keep the money. And so he, you see him start that shift to right. investing in people instead of money, but he still has sold the barbershop. So right. still trying to figure that out. He has to go inside and tell the rest of the crew Today's the last day, like I sold the barbershop. Everyone's really upset. This is when the police bust in, arrest Ricky. And this is when you find out that JD borrowed Ricky's truck last night. Right. And so Isaac and Jimmy have a conversation because Jimmy's still kind of poking at Isaac. And Isaac's like, just because you went to college doesn't make you better than anyone else. And this is who I am. This is who I'm going to be tomorrow in right. 10 years. This is who I am. So Jimmy says, prove it, hook me up with a haircut and it's a pretty damn good haircut. So Isaac has proven himself, which I would think to get the job, you would have to cut someone's hair. Right. I mean, he does call that out. He's like, Calvin would never hire me if I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, for Jimmy, it's a huge step in the right direction. I think the whole barbershop closing and the whole Ricky putting him in his place kind of cemented that maybe I do have a stick up my ass and I need to, like, stop. Give people (laughs) a chance. There is an entire scene where Eddie, as the elder, goes into a whole diatribe about Rosa Parks and how she didn't really do anything but sit down and she wasn't the first like he goes into this rant and Mm -hmm. before the movie came out it was like a big stink because even though this movie is a black movie this it's still going to be open to 
white audiences as well. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the times that the kind of conversations you would have in Black spaces are not always things that you want to have in open scenarios. And so this whole like spew of things that he says, the nuance of it is within our community. We kind we understand because we know Anetti. We know mm-hmm. where that's coming from, but they still put it in the movie. So Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton pressured MGM to edit the scenes out for the film before its DVD release. And they still released it with the controversial scenes. A lot of people were mad about it. I will say that what he said about Rosa Parks and the NAACP, because she did work for the NAACP and she was a part of that group with Martin Luther King and everything like that, it was strategic. And he was correct in saying that Rosa Parks was not the first person to refuse to go to the back of the bus. She was Mm -hmm. not the first. And it's something that is a little bit more well-known now to the public, I think, but it wasn't something that was as, like, we all know who Rosa Parks is, but the original person that did it first, even, it was just like, it's only a few months before Rosa Parks situation happened. Claudette Colvin, she was only 15, and she refused to go to the back of the bus. And again, she's probably not the only person that did it. And he's kind of saying that, but not saying it in the greatest way. Yeah. Uh, But what you have to understand is Rosa Park doing it was strategic because this was kicking off right before the Montgomery bus boycotts, right? And it brought in publicity. I don't want to say they did PR behind it, but it was a stepping stone to where they needed to go to launch this. So it was strategic. It wasn't, she. they wanted her to be the face essentially right. of this whole situation. And it worked, whether it's right or wrong, how it was portrayed in that way, but it was integral into the civil rights movement. Um, I just think the way that they, Cedric the Entertainer's character goes about saying it in the movie is just like very... I can understand why it's very controversial Mm -hmm. and in the wrong hands could be used as a talking piece in a very dangerous way, essentially. So I just wanted to explain that. So at this part and point, Calvin's gone home. His wife comes and sits down with a cup of tea, it looks like. And he's like, oh, thank you, baby. And I don't know why he thought that was for him, though. Like arrogant much. Yeah. She's fucking pregnant. What have you done for her? Yeah, except sold her the shop and taken away all her stability. And she's like, I guess she can invest in the studio now. Yeah, she's she like, gives it to him quite. But then she caves and says, you know what? Hopefully it works. If it doesn't, we'll get through it. And then my uncle will give you a job. Yep. And then Calvin has to head back out because he's bailing Ricky out of jail. Ricky's like, I did not do this. It was my cousin. He borrowed my car last night. And Kelvin says, if I thought you did this, I wouldn't have bailed you out of jail. And so that's more of like investing in people because I'm sure he had to use part of that 20 grand to bail Ricky out. Yeah. And Ricky gets really upset. It's my cousin. I'm going to go over there. I'm going to find him blah, blah, blah. And finally, and Calvin's trying to talk him down. It's not working. And Ricky's like, just drop me off. Just drop me off. So Calvin's like, if you want to go get your gun here, it's right here. And it's in the glove box. Gives Ricky the gun. He's like, don't prove me wrong. I bailed you out. Like you're getting your life right. Don't make this be your third strike. And let's note that he calls JD from jail mm-hmm. and and tells him like you you I let you borrow my truck and you went and fucking stole an ATM with my truck and now I'm in jail and it's gonna be my third strike and JD just laughs and is like well by the time you get out I'll be long gone you won't be able to find me JD is his fucking cousin mm-hmm. that's why family is not always family <laughs> So I understand why he is so mad. Yeah. Because what the fuck? 
But he does, he's like, pull over right now and chucks the gun into the river. So he's listening to what Calvin has to stay, say, internalizing that. And now they're going to see Mr. Wallace. Yeah. Meanwhile, JD is at his old place of work. So what you find out is Mr. Wallace is slowly buying up businesses in the area. One of the businesses was a mechanic. And he's turned it into a chop shop. And so JD goes to his old place of work, which is the mechanic shop. And for some reason that they gave this man a welder, I don't know what the fuck is happening. Him and Billy start fighting over a lit fucking welder. No one has like safety equipment on. Like you should be wearing... Well, he does have it. He does have the helmet thing on. Yeah, JD does. But yeah, yeah he doesn't have the leather. Yeah, this is when Calvin and Ricky show up. And Mr. Wallace comes out and Calvin's like, I want my shot back. I like that all this shit is happening. And Calvin's like, yo, I just want my, <laughs> yeah, want like, my shot. <laughs> Not why are you here? What's going yep. on? and calvin's like here's your money back blah 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 well yeah he's like i think the cops would be interested that you have a stolen atm and these two knuckleheads over here and then ricky's like and by the way it looks like you got a chop shop situation going on and before all this starts to go down because they noticed that the car outside was jd and ricky's Mm -hmm. grandmother's so he knows his cousin is there and this was just like an accident because they were again they weren't looking for his cousin they had given that up but he had called the cops beforehand or he just says he's gonna get back up so we don't know it's the cops or whatever but the cops do bust in now if calvin didn't have a relationship with that particular cop i feel like that particular cop would have put ricky in jail his cousin that they were all complacent and the loan shark yep So the cops bust in, arrest Mr. Wallace and JD and Billy. And then Calvin also notices on the side of the ATM that there's a reward if found sticker for $50,000. And so he's like to the detective, by the way, make sure it's noted that I found this shit. I just feel like, I don't know if they're going to get the reward. They would get a reward as fucked up as the ATM machine was. And there's no money in it. I'm sure yeah. they're like, eh, eh. Yeah. But the next scene is a couple months later. It looks like the barbershop has had a facelift. So obviously he collected in on that ATM reward <laughs> money. And happy just working at the barbershop. His wife shows up with their brand new baby and it pans out. But someone is still drinking Terry's damn apple juice. <laughs> and that's barbershop. It is. A few things. Let's see. Jason George, who played Terry's boyfriend, originally auditioned for the role of Ricky. Honestly, I would have been happy with that too because I they're fine as hell, both of them. The And the cast also spent a month training at a barber college to prepare for their roles. It was actually, funny twist, only Troy Garrity had had previous experience cutting hair. So the one who seems to be the least experienced in the movie. So in 2004, we get the sequel, Barbershop 2, Back in Business. Then we have a Billy Woodruff directed spinoff entitled Beauty Shop with Queen Latifah as the lead in March 2005. During the fall of 2005, State Street and Ice Cube debuted Barbershop the series on Showtime. But Omar Gooding took over the Ice Cube's role of Calvin. And then in 2016, a third Barbershop film was released titled Barbershop, The Next Cut. Which, out of this entire series, I find it hilarious that my favorite is Beauty Shop. I feel like I would have liked a whole series of that versus all the other Barbershop (laughs) movies. Love Queen Latifah and that movie as a whole was fun. Kevin Bacon being an absolute douchebag in that movie, Alicia Silverstone dropping it like it's hot. I'm very excited for when we do that movie. I've never seen Beauty Shop. You know what, Jackie? I'm sorry. It's me. It's me. As a as your black best friend, I didn't do good. 
I didn't make you watch that. what I made you watch. Woo, Jesus! I wasn't. You know, you know right. what movie I did watch? What hair show with Monique? That that fucking movie was great. That <laughs> movie was great. And you know what? I can't find it. So there was Beauty Shop, Nora's hair salon, I think it was called, mm-hmm. and hair show. And I can't find hair show streaming anywhere. Mm-hmm. I can't. That hair show and fat girls. You know, Monique was in her bag. I'm gonna say it. I, I, I love like Monique. Yeah. I love her comedy. Like her stand up is great. Because around that time, we got all of like the blue collar comedy tour, and then we got. I gotta correct you and say that it started with Kings of Comedy. Thank you. Then that's what. Got, I, that's I, where you're getting yeah, to. Sorry. Yeah. So we have Kings of Comedy, Queens of Comedy, and obviously, like my favorites uh, queens of comedy is just top notch there's nothing like it i i've watched that comedy special so many times and then kings of comedy is great too and then like out of the three blue collar is like least like you know <laughs> when i saw kings of comedy i think it came out in like it had to come out in, the, in 2000 2001 I early 2000s yeah mm-hmm. N- I laughed a lot, but now if I rewatch it, I think Bernie Mac is probably the only one that does it for me. Mm -hmm. I don't mind Cedric's as much because this, where he talks about taking (laughs) when white people try to leave us to go to the moon or wherever we're going to be in our Cadillacs or whatever, trying (laughs) to, you ain't leaving us, bitch. (laughs) I like Bernie Mac's comment because he does talk about taking in his nieces and nephews and raising them and so a lot of that is funny but we digress tell us our social handles danielle so if you have any feedback on barbershop or anything that we talked about during this episode or any of our other episodes make sure you hit us up on instagram facebook tiktok twitter youtube at no more late fees and jackie i'm gonna start with you what is your today rating after finally seeing the movie? I'm going to give it a two day. I do love Ice Cube. There are far better vehicles for him. But I am very interested to watch the sequels because I think finding out more about the characters would be super interesting. Yeah. So I, I am interested, excited to watch the sequels and then obviously Beauty Shop. Yeah, I think in our time frame, what we I think we only get the second movie in beauty Mm -hmm. shop we don't get the third one i'm going on two-day rental again i saw it i'm probably not going to watch it again it it is what it is (laughs) i've enjoyed better it's just not my fave agreed Uh, so if you have any hot takes any blockbuster video stories after our trailer if you haven't listened to our trailer go back and listen to it because it's just danielle and i in our blockbuster element Mm mm-hmm and so give us a call at our quick drop 909-601-6653, 909-601-NMLF, and twat us at the Twitters, or leave a voice message at Anchor FM for our international callers and listeners. And you can be featured on a future episode. Danielle, we got a birthday shout out. Yes. Let me get closer to the mic. We have a special birthday shout out. This Happy one goes out. Birthday. This goes. This one goes out to Shannon. You know who you are. Our sugar mama, not mad our, at it. Our hardest critic, the big sister I never had, and we just love you so so much. And, and you troll Danielle so beautifully. And maybe in another life you'll be my stepmom. You know what it means. <laughs> Happy birthday! Happy birthday! And join us next week as we go back to the start of Kevin Smith's career with the special throwback episode featuring the 1994 classic Clerks. And our favorite friend, Nick, is going to be joining us. I can't wait to just like give him those moments again like we did in Monsters, Inc. I feel like it's one of my favorite things to do is to troll Nick. I can't wait. I am so excited. It's no (laughs) secret. I am uber kevin smith fan and just the start of the view universe is so exciting to me i'm in the middle of rewatching it right now 
I haven't started. I need to like be be in the zone. Auto and zones. <laughs> <laughs> and as always, be kind and rewind.